This is my final interview, and I've um, been really looking forward to this. And I was thinking, how, how does one sort of introduce uh, the next speaker? Uh, it's a bit of a tough one, really, because a lot has been said about the man already. But um, Laxmi this morning uh, said something that gave me a little, a little angle. She said, when she was talking about corporate responsibility and change, she said, um, she said corporates are the new Medicis. Do you remember that? Um, and in a way, we have quite an empire builder in advertising uh, who we're about to speak to. Um, and yet, you may not realize this, it all began with the male menopause. Did you know that? It did. Um, at least that was the joke that um, Sir Martin told me when I first met him about 13 or 14 years ago. It was the andropause uh, at the age of 40 that led him to leave Saatchi and Saatchi and in 1985 to buy a strange little company in the north of England called Wire and Plastic Products. Um, in 1987, just two years after buying that, that investment vehicle, um, WPP acquired J. Walter, J. Walter Thompson for $566 million. In 1988, they listed on the NASDAQ. In 1989, uh, quite famously now in, in global industry, uh, Martin led the bid for, for Ogilvy uh, and acquired that business for over $800 uh, million. Um, in the same year, 1989, WPP had its first board meeting in China, really marking that business out as one of the most progressive, internationally expansive marketing services companies. So the signs were there um, all those years ago. And that was only, I've just described just the first four years um, of the journey. Um, I'm not going to describe any more, but perhaps Sir Martin Sorrell has done more than anyone to establish advertising um, as a respected business, not necessarily as the um, amateurish profession that it may well have been in the days of Mad Men. Uh, a professional business, not just in the minds of global industry and other corporates, but in the minds of the advertising industry itself to realize that it's, uh, its place in the global economy. Um, and a few days ago, um, WPP reported its 2012 uh, results, and it was another record year for the company. Revenues up 3.5% to £10.4 billion pounds sterling, and profits up to about £1.1 billion, uh, up 8%, consolidating WPP's position as the world's largest uh, marketing services conglomerate. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sir Martin Sorrell. That was an awfully long introduction, Charlie. There's no, no time for an interview. Okay, we've finished. Got, okay. Well, it's the I, only hate, way, it's, I hate the word conglomerate. It's I, the only I way. It. It's the only way I'm going to get a word in in this interview. I thought at least I'll just get the words out the way for five well, minutes. We'll, we'll then, start. We'll start and finish that way. Okay. Okay. So, um, okay. Let's just turn to your to your results first. You, yeah. you you said in the press uh, when the results released that you got there ugly, right? Um, in terms of just scraping to your targets. What did you right. mean by that? Uh, the, the, when we when we sort of dra drafted that, or I, I like to draft those things myself. And uh, the board went, the, the members of the board thought that was you know, a little bit extreme. And I thought it was rather good, actually. So anyway, and the fact that you picked up on it makes it even better. Um, well, by ugly, I mean it was difficult. So 2012, um, everything didn't go the way that we sort of intentioned, although we got, where, we got there um, in the end. But in 2011, we fired, on, I think we fired, if not on all cylinders, I would say most of them. So in fact, you can see it. I know it's controversial to talk about incentives and all that sort of stuff and compensation. But if you, you look at it, because we, we are the only group that disclose actually what we pay people in incentives. It's interesting that nobody else does. And one always wonders why they don't, but they don't. And we, so we show our margins before incentives and after it. And you can see it quite clearly, because at maximum performance, we pay 20%, and in 2011, we paid about 19.5%. This is of operating profits before bonuses. And uh, last year, the year that you, you mentioned, 2012, we, we paid about 16, 16.5%. So we, we hit targets rather than the maxima. And the reasons you know, are quite clear. The mature markets, 
of uh, Western Europe and the United States were under more pressure. Um, the fast-growing markets grew faster. Yep. Uh, I hate using the word emerging markets because I think it's insulting, for example, to the Chinese to say to them that they're an emerging market when they're already the second largest market in the world. And the third largest market by revenue for WPP now. Yes, the third by, by revenue after the US and the UK. Um, so that, uh, digital obviously grew faster than the average. Advertising and media investment management, particularly media planning and buying, what we call media investment management, grew faster than the average. So the year was a sort of strange one. We over-invested in people late 2011, two, uh, going into 2012. We budgeted 4% like for like, and as you said, uh, our reported st sterling went against us uh, in the sense that it strengthened, although it's now weakened, so this year will be better for us in terms of currency headwinds or tailwinds, there won't be headwinds. But uh, basically, our like-for-like -like growth was 2.9% for the year. We've budgeted four. Q1, we were up four. Q2, it went to three. Q3 to two. And then in Q4, we did slightly better. We were up 2.5%. Few of the city so, analysts are thinking four is still a, a, a little bit of a of a large growth. They think you might be being well, a little over optimistic I, like you were. Yes, sort of we, we, went, we started at four. Actually, the end of Q1 last year, about this time last year, we were feeling a bit bullish. And we didn't say how much more we thought for, we would grow by four, but uh, we thought we'd do a little bit better and we were wrong. But we, on the, on the profitability side, and margin side, we overhired. So we, right. our headcount actually for the year was flat. So we go into 2013, I don't want to sound overly bullish, but we go into 2013 feeling quite good about the way the business is balanced. And I know this is people thing that, you know, you referred to Mad Men days and Don Draper and, you know, I think we are, we are still mad men, but we are also maths men, if you want to put it. I like that sort of balance. Our business is no longer just an art, it's a, a science as well, whether, whether traditional uh, traditional people like that or not. So getting the balance right between art and science and uh, maths and madmen is, I think, critical. But the balance in our business is very, uh, is very good at the moment. I feel good about it because we started towards the end of last year to put, get more balance into the headcount versus revenue growth. And, you know, you've been notorious for, for reading the economic situation with some wonderfully Beautiful metaphors. Beautiful. The bath-shaped recovery, love, yes. uh, and, and all the other. Spectacular uh, stuff. Are we, where are we? Are we, in a, are we in a bath at the moment? Are we in a love no, shape? No, we're, 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 really we're wrestling with gray swans, is the, the, that's the, latest, four. the latest iteration. It's four. Yeah. So four, yes, four David, Cameron, David Cameron gave us a fifth. So the four before the EU referendum on Britain's uh, staying in the, or Britain staying in the uh, EU, which may happen in 2016, 17. There were four. The first was the Eurozone, yep. and Mario Draghi has not solved that, but he's sort of at least put off the evil day or, or balanced things, although we have the Italian election and we have the corruption issues in Spain, although that doesn't look as though it'll, mm -hmm. it'll derail things. That was number one. Number two was Middle East, and the gray swans have got blacker in the Middle East. I mean, the Middle East really does worry me. Uh, I was in Washington with the Business Council, which is the sort of, uh, there are two, there's the Business Roundtable in the US and the Business Council, so these are the largest companies in America. And listening to the administration, and we get a good access to the administration, uh, talk about the potential problems in Iran, uh, North Korea, uh, but the, the Iranian stuff is pretty frightening. They're very worried about the oil price in America, aren't they? Yeah, but it's the Iranian nuclear uh, position that you know is is almost unstoppable in many respects. You know, sanction, one hopes that sanctions will work because certainly an Israeli attack or an American attack may not be uh, on the nuclear installations may not be successful. So it, it's inevitable in many people's minds that the Iranians will have a nuclear capability in the Middle East, which will lead to proliferation. So that's a big issue. Uh, the third issue would be China hard soft landing. I think that's off the agenda. Yeah. You know, we've been saying for two years that the 12th five-year plan talked about higher quality, lower quantum growth in China. I turn on, I arrive here this morning, turn on CNBC, and that's what they're talking about. Yeah. So finally, we're all woken up to the fact that the Chinese, you know, a state-directed economy, state-directed capitalism works, and I think will work to an in increasingly intensified 
degree, and it goes back to 1989, as you, you graciously pointed out. So, and the 12 five year plan is about consumption rather than savings, about our healthcare, social security, safety net, and it's about service businesses, all of which was repeated on CNBC today, all of which we've been talking about for two or three years. So, I think hard, hard soft landing is off the agenda. That applies also to Brazil, India, and Russia. Not so much Brazil, because Brazil actually has fallen behind yeah. the UK again, having surpassed us in football. They then surpassed us in, uh, we might come on to in Ronaldo. terms of GN, GMP. We well, Ronaldo is another issue. Yes, my apprentice. Yeah, we might, yes. um, <laughs> we might come to that. Um, but Not anyways. in football, I hasten to add. <laughs> He's rubbish at China, hard, hard soft landing. And then the final one is the, the elephant in the room, as we referred to it which is the US deficit, which has not been solved, and we're in the midst of this sequester debate at the moment. And the fifth one is Cameron's EU. Yeah. But, so uh, aside from the, the, these, these swans, as, uh, as nicely put, um, you feel pretty bullish about the global economy right now. Then, obviously. I don't feel bullish. I, I, you know, I, th I feel, listen, clients, you know, you asked me about 2012 and why it was so difficult. Clients are very, very tough. I mean, I know we've got a number of clients in the, in the room. Um, I don't want to upset anybody who, who may be in the finance and procurement functions. After all, I'm an ex-CFO, so I'm probably more sensitive to it than most in some respects. But the balance of power inside companies has shifted, particularly since Lehman in September 2008. But you could track it back to the late 80s and 1990, because we actually haven't had much retail price inflation mm -hmm. since 1990. But uh, so. Pricing power amongst clients has been very limited. At the same time, retail has become more powerful. So Walmart, Tesco, Carrefour, although they all have their issues to deal with strategically, have become much more powerful. If you don't have the pricing power, the pressure is on the supply chain, particularly when commodity prices, although they've leveled off in the last year or two, Commodity prices, if you look against a, on a five-year trend basis, are up substantially. So margins have come under pressure for manufacturers, so they squeeze to the supply chain of which we are a part. Yeah. Okay. And the rise of finance and procurement has been, at, I think, at the expense of marketing. Uh, as Jeremy Bullmore has pointed out ad nauseam for many years, there is a limit to what you can do on the cost side, a finite limit, whereas at least until you get to 100% market share, it's unlimited what you can do on the revenue side. The hope is that uh, 2013 might mark a year when clients realize this and start to invest more in brand. I mean, basically, we have a situation where anybody running a major multinational will invest in the BRICS and Next 11, and they'll invest in capacity and behind brand. In the mature markets, they're taking capacity out or, or controlling it, and maybe investing in brand to maintain or increase market share. That's the reason it's so tough. I think. Interesting you mentioned retailers, actually, in your response, because you know, you've got these, these huge organizations like, like Amazon and Walmart, mm. as you say, looking like they're getting into the content business. Yeah. Um, uh, in fact, many of these big re retailers are beginning to describe themselves more as content companies. Yeah. Um, Amazon, of course, you know, is hugely powerful. I mean, do you see that that, that trend becoming a potential threat to some of your operating companies at WPP in terms of disintermediation? No, I, I, I don't. I mean, just one point on the retail side, which is interesting. It came up today whilst we were in Singapore. <coughs> at the same time, you've got the, the growing global retailers or retailers on a national basis. You've had the growth of proximity retailing, of local retailing. And this is going to pose some interesting challenges for the big, big box retailers uh, and indeed for manufacturers. And of course, give some, some added um, traction to local manufacturers who generally have better distribution than, than, than big manufacturers, the multinational manufacturers. Now, I don't, I don't see, you know, if you're saying, you know, we had to wrestle with the G word, you know, five or 10 years ago, five years ago, analysts would say, WPP's finished or our competitors are finished because of Google, right? And I'm not, I'm not putting that to one side. I think Google is still a frenemy. I know that that, yeah, we'll, we'll come, that, we'll doesn't, talk, that yeah. doesn't find, um, make some people happy saying that, but I'll say it again because I think it's true. Um, and, and so there was the G word. Then it was the R word, you know, would the recession kill us, particularly after, yeah. after Lehman in 2008. Now, if you're suggesting the R word, retail, I, I, I don't think so. I think 
we can work very effectively with retailers. I mean, we have a very interesting stake in two, two companies, both based in South Africa by, uh, by coincidence. One is called Smollen, which specializes in in-store uh, distribution, massive, operates not just in South Africa, but operates in Asia, in China, in India, in Brazil, and also Barrows, which creates in-store environments for manufacturers, right? not just shelf wobblers. Yeah. You yeah. Know, which, I mean, I'm talking about really significant things. So I think we're playing a lot in the retail and shopper area. We're going to announce another initiative shortly, big initiative in shopper and activation. And so I think, I think we are really getting to grips. You know, if you go, we have our uh, Carl Hartman, who runs the uh, Kimberly Clark business for us, has also uh, built this horizontal that we have in shopper marketing, um, and that's, that's really interesting in terms of what our capabilities are in store. So I think retailers are very much partners. I mean, there could be some frenemy element to it as well in terms of content, but no, I think generally there, there are partnerships. You've earmarked in, in your annual report 300 to 400 million pounds sterling in terms of to, to, yeah. for acquisitions. Um, I assume shopper marketing and those elements are going to be increasing part of that, but, but what else? What, what are sort of things you look on the lookout well, for? Well, you know, strategy is clear. It might be wrong, but it's clear. So new markets, bricks and next to Did 11. you just admit that you, you admit you might be wrong? I've always admitted that, Charlie. It's just that you don't, don't no, want okay, to listen okay, to that, okay, so you, you just, missed it. All right. You, you, don't, you don't take it all in. You, know, you automatically think that the Burke is not going to yeah, say okay, you could on. ever be wrong. That's say, fine. So. That's fine. So, so. So I've always said, you know, it's, our strategy is simple, it might be wrong, I've always said that. Uh, but it's new markets, so it's BRICS and Next 11. It's new media, digital, in all its guises. So it's not just search, it's the five legs of Google. I mean, Google is an incredibly, I think, sophisticated, and although it's in five areas, focused organization, I, th I would say even more sin so since Larry Page has become CEO. So it's not just search, it's display, it's video, it's social, and it's mobile. And the Motorola Mobility acquisition, I think, has enabled them to understand both software and hardware, whether it's Android and handsets, much better than the competition. Facebook's issue is it's rooted in social, it's trying to get into mobile and other areas. In my view is it should relax. It is a okay. different so form of communication. Back, back, but, to, back to Google. You know, yeah. that's, um, I guess your, your market cap now, you're probably trading on what? 20 and a half billion. Oh, 20 and a half? That's 20 and a half So billion trading dollars. on what, 15? 14 uh, times. 14 times earnings. Mm -hmm. Google will be trading probably 25 to 26. No, 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 no. It's, I mean, Google, I, I'm trying to remember how, I think Google is about 40 billion, 45 billion of revenue, and it's revenue. trading, last time I checked, it was about 260, 260. billion. 260. Yeah, it's so when, embarrassing, when, right, isn't it? So when you look, right. So when here, you, we, when, here we are at 17 right. billion, and we're only valued at 20. Right, to Horrendous. my point, do you, when you look at those, that, that difference in the market caps and the, and, and the multiples, um, I'm the valuations green market, with envy. Do you get envious? Do you think, do you think, <laughs> but do you think that's, a, do you think that's, I mean, you have 160,000 staff, they have, what, 25,000? It also staff. tells you something. Right, so do you, when you look at the Google numbers, do you, do, you, do you feel envious? Do you think there's anything that the marketing services business can learn from it in terms of efficiencies um, and, and in terms of techno technology? Well, it's not, it's not about efficiencies. It's about, um, you know, it's about pushing on open doors or going where the opportunities are. And I, th I think this comes back to this art and science point. And I think the real opportunities for us are increasing. You know, if you look at our strategy, it's new media, new markets, the application of technology to our business, and big data, and last but not least, horizontality, which conjures up all sorts of images in people's mind, but not the ones, not the images that you're thinking about. <laughs> and 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 horizontality means getting people to work together. Yeah, we'll come, we'll so, come to that. We'll come to that. So if you take the third of them, application of technology to our business and big data. That is where the Google type opportunity is. And if you look at our competitive set, and this is sort of more akin to WPP than it is to our direct competition. So you've got, you've got several, several different sets of competitors. You've got Omnicom, Publicis, IPG, Havas, Dentsu plus Aegis, if, if we, see, we finally see approval for that transaction. Yep. Um, so that's one set. The second set are obviously our research competitors like Nielsen, Ipsos, GFK. 
The third set is what I would call, I, I would call the, 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 the new media owners, as I call them. Yep. Uh, Google, Twitter, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft. And they're the sort of frenemies in that sense. And then the final set would be the consulting companies, you know, IBM's, Accenture's, Deloitte's, that have got technology uh, biases to them. So that our customers are no longer just the CMOs or the CEOs. They are the CIOs and the CTOs. So when we acquire 20% of Globan, which has 2,700 software engineers in Latin America, who are building supply-side platforms for marketeers and other parts of the organization. When we buy sal uh, Salmon in the UK, which is the largest e-commerce site builder, has built the second largest e-commerce site for Argos, second only to Amazon in the UK, and a lot of retail sites. When we have our relationship with e commerce where we have a minority stake, which is also in the e-commerce area, that is taking us into those sorts of areas that are on the, on the surface more productive in terms of revenue per head and profitability. Head and now you've been, you know, obviously your uh, support for Buddy Media paid off pretty well. In yeah, but I, you know, I was, you've, but you've always was, been, you've I was always disappointed been... about that because, why, why so? why well, so? it happened too quickly because it's rather like Omniture, exactly the same. Adobe comes along and snap, snaps up right. Omniture. I mean, in a way it's a compliment, but, and then we have salesforce.com doing the same with Buddy Media. I mean, the great things about those investments, we, we act as a strategic venture capital company which answers the question in part about the 300 to 400 million. You know, we invest along our strategy. I mean, today we bought uh, a company in, in Canada to, to bolster our traditional, more our traditional capabilities. But that's, you know, that's, the strategy is really built around digital and around fast growing markets. So last week it was South Africa and mobile and Turkey and digital. Yeah. So that would be very much where we're concentrated. And, and on VC type, yeah. strategic VC type investments like Omniture, like Buddy Media, like a jewel, whatever it happens to be. So just going back to the Buddy Media thing, you know, you've been supportive of it, but you've always been in the press quite lukewarm about Facebook to a certain extent, but certainly more recently Twitter in terms of the, the quality of those platforms for your clients. No, 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 that's and not, no, no again, it's, it, that's, that's sort of, that's not right, if I can be so bold. You may. Um, all I'm saying on, on, on Facebook is it's not an advertising medium. It's a branding medium. It's the most, you can't deny, and you know, some people at Facebook get upset with me when I call it a branding medium, but I'm not being derogatory. That's, that's more a compliment. Or Facebook's issue, if I could be so bold as to comment on that, was that it, it was in a very high profile, very expensive IPO. Yep. The, 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 the bankers and the institutions were putting pressure on them to monetize, and they should just be relaxed. You know, this is a marathon, not a 100-meter sprint. Mm. And they were just being put under, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, actually, in the S1, if you read the S1 carefully, it almost looks as though he's saying, I didn't really want to go public. And there was no reason for him to do so. In fact, it was more to create a currency for people who worked inside the company. So it was, it was undue pressure. This is a, 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 an entity that has the third largest country in the planet. After, after China and India, it's got more than a billion users. It will probably become the biggest country on the planet. So just relax. But it is a great branding mechanism. So if I can get anybody to write anything decent on Facebook about this interview, which on the basis of the quality of your questioning, I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if I, if and I. <laughs> and, and, on the basis, and on the basis of your <laughs> answers, I am doubly sure. <laughs> Woof. Um, no, but if I can get somebody to write something nice about you or me, you know, we'll have done Festival of Media some good, and we'll have done WPP some good, and maybe Charlie and Martin some good as well. But having said, having said that, you've got to look at it on the basis of long-term branding. Twitter, to my mind, is a phenomenally powerful public relations medium. Look at what happened at the Olympics. The medium, at the London Olympics, the medium that scored best was Twitter. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. Uh, you know, Facebook, I, I think, was relatively, I found it relatively difficult in the context of the Olympics. Google probably did a little bit better with search. But search, you know, you're catching people at a very different point in the purchase cycle. Yeah. You know, we know <clears throat> that 90%, I said this in the Harvard Business Review article, 90% of automobile purchases involve some form of search at some point in time in the cycle. 
So you catch people at the right time. And, and, and Facebook is, is, a, is what it is. It's a social network. It's a social interaction between people. You interrupt it at your peril. And we said this two or three years ago. We were laughed at. I think you see, you see and hear more people talking about it in those terms. Having said that, it's immensely powerful. If you can get a billion people talking well about your brand and the customer experience, you know, you go to a store in Tokyo and it was fantastic and the product was fantastic, whatever, honestly, it's great. Just moving into that digital realm a bit more, um, we'll be talking later on about real-time bidding, the programmatic a revolution that's happening in mm. advertising. Where do, how do you see the future of that? Do you feel like... Well, our Zaxxis platform, which, we, which, which came out of our purchase of 24-7 um, Real Media. Now, we, we couldn't afford the ticket at the table for... Oh, look, there's a movable curtain. Um, <laughs> that shot, shot. Shedding, shedding more light on some shedding more light, the right. Festival of Media Age. Obviously, there's too much gloom in here. Um, but if you... you know, Google went for DoubleClick very successfully. Yep and very expensively. Microsoft went for Avenue A. Or we, we've now seen the Atlas platform interestingly sold to Facebook. We made a sort of poor man's bet. David Moore, who still runs 24-7 and very successfully runs 24-7 media, as it's now called, always dislikes this comment, but this was the poor man's bet at the table. Actually, relatively, it was exactly the same relative commitment that we made to 24-7 real media as Google and Microsoft made in their respective transactions, relatively in terms of size. But out of that came the MIG platform, the B3 platform, and now Zaxxis. That is an opt-in platform which buys online inventory in the, uh, across the board. In, in such a, we're in 19 markets now. It's extremely successful. So my view is everything you're talking about will become more and more important, and we have got to... See, this is the thing that differentiates us from our competition. We do believe that we are the intermediary. We manage a $72 billion portfolio of media, and we believe it's our responsibility to guide our clients between the media. I mean, Google, Twitter, Facebook are media owners. They're not technology companies. They're, they're media owners masquerading as technology companies. They're just like News Corp, they're just like Viacom, they're just like CNBC, Disney, et cetera. And the confusion comes when you confuse, I think, that point. So we do have a role, how much clients should spend and whether they should spend it. Okay, um, I'm hogging you here, um, but let's, um, let's open this up to the audience. So we have a, a question that's trending the highest right now on our system with nine votes. That sounds like trouble. Actually. Um, actually, to be fair, it's, it's a very non-specific, gentle question, which is a Good bit, grief. To be honest, he, he deserved to be harder than, on, than Martin. Particularly than after my comment on the quality of your question. Yeah, totally right. Come on, ask him something really tough. But anyway, really the, the question is, what's, what is, he's up here now, what is the most exciting decision we should be looking forward to from WPP this year? I think WPP should be boring this year, actually. I, I think... I, I, I think I think boringly successful. One of our clients, I won't say, say which, I asked an institution, why is it that you, you rate it? Um, and they said, boringly profitable. Um, no, I, I think it's more, I, I hate to disappoint the questioners, um, but it's really about more of the same. So it's more, you know, if I, one thing I regret about the last few years, bricks and next 11 are a third of our business, or 30% to be accurate. Digital is a third. I, re I regret we haven't got more of it. So if you think worldwide waiting, it's about, actually, BRICS and Next 11 probably would be about 40%, so we're still a little bit one wing low on that, although we're much, much more penetrative than any of our co competition. Digital, we're a, th we're a third with AKQA, 32% without last year. I, I would say, you know, we, we've said, again, target of 35 to 40, maybe, that, Worldwide average is 20. Yeah, that's right. So yeah. we're overweight. So, I, but I would regret. So, so to to go back to the question, more of that, more of the application of technology, more Zaxis and Zaxis-like initiatives, more big data initiatives. By the way, big data is people use that phrase, but it's nothing more fancy than coordinating sources of data. So, taking all the data that we have, we have four and a half billion dollars of of income 
out of 17 billion, which comes from, from consumer insight, as we call it, market research. It's really coordinating that data and the other sources of data and having real-time dashboards that clients can use in effective ways. That's critically important. And the last thing is getting people to work more extensively together. Obviously, you made a massive acquisition of TNS Software it's not that, that long ago. You've built quite an interesting um, people meter business as well. You have quite a lot of syndicated research in the business. So with big data, and this is a question reflected by many people here in the audience through the system, with all this big data, do you think that conventional market research business are pretty defunct? No, I don't. I mean, obviously, we've got the custom research business. I was reading uh, Nielsen's, the transcript on Nielsen's uh, fourth quarter was when I was coming on the plane this morning. And I, I, you know, it's clear that the custom business, because it is sort of discretionary spending, has been under pressure. Yeah. You know, they saw some of their markets down. Well, not, I think they're, they're their, their, customer, their custom business was down about 8% last year, which was quite, quite high. And there has been pressure on discretionary spending. So we've seen that in the public relations business. We've seen that in the branding and identity business, and we've seen that in the customer research. The syndicated business, uh, things like Cantile World Panel, Needscope, uh, the copy testing, Millwood Brown's copy testing and tracking, uh, continues to grow, particularly in the fast-growing markets. Uh, in the slow growth market, but even in the slow growth markets, those, those syndicated businesses grow, as Nielsen has seen yeah. as well. But um, audience measurement is very interesting. We are the sort of, uh, I call it the, the, the non-American Nielsen in that sense, because yeah. we do it in about do a lot in 40 America markets. A yeah. lot in Latin America with Ibope, a lot in Asia. We do feel it. anachronistic now, that business model? No, because if you extend it into the new media, it's far from anachronistic. Now, the interesting thing about the new, the new technologies, if I look at Lightspeed, which I think has six million consumers on it, which is our online panel, the profitability on that panel, actually the margins on that panel, surpass on our, our traditional business. So this is another example of where the new, media, the new technologies have made uh, existing models, even the potential, even more profitable. Right. Right. Okay. Um, back to a question. Uh, the, the the biggest trending one currently, and, and it's um, got nicely links actually with, uh, to the digital conversation. So many of your operating companies now, even the media agencies, um, are talking about themselves as content businesses. Yeah. Um, most of your clients now are considering themselves as publishers, and many yeah. of the themes over the last couple of days have, have yeah. reflected that. Um, by how much do you think you're in the content creation business now? Um, well, I think it's a vital part of it, you know, whether it's um, China's got talent, uh, whether it's uh, investing in Imagina in Spain, which controls the rights to the Spanish league, La Liga, uh, whether it's a, a, a slight, slightly more difficult investment in the Weinstein Company, but a much well, more... Why, diff why difficult? Well, because, you know, f f when, when Wall Street meets Hollywood, Hollywood always wins. <laughs> um, and then Media Rights Capital we, with Bruno, with Ted with House of Cards, which was distributed on Net Netflix, yeah. we've, we've, we've invested in those things. And invested in, in, by what do you mean? Directly as WPP? Or your well, we have a 20% investment in Imagina, which makes those things. It does a lot of uh, Hispanic programming. Um, Media Rights Capital uh, you know, has done a lot of interesting things, as I mentioned. Uh, and then you've got, um, so the content area, and then in a way, you know, what we're doing with Ronaldo in Brazil on a much smaller scale, uh, but is sort of the same thing. And we're moving into, you know, not Ronaldo's business also manages um, people in the sports business. We, we have the rights to Pelé uh, around, around the world outside Brazil in relation to the World Cup. So I think there are some things that we're doing in the content area which are very interesting. We should do more of them. Uh, we do a lot of programming. You know, we have somebody permanently in Hollywood uh, on the West Coast, looking at what we should do, not just in new media, but in traditional media. We now have Tom Bedicari on the West Coast as well, uh, looking after WPP Ventures, who's one of the principals in AKQA. So we're, we're trying to do more and more of that sort of thing. I mean, it's not an easy area. Mm. Um, you know, I worked for Mark McCormack many, many years ago, and in the early days, McCormack would always lay off any rights payments that he had to match the revenues that would come through. He never would take any risk. Now, of course, people take risk in these Do areas. you see yourself um, in the same way that you challenged 20-odd, seven years ago, existing 
infrastructures in advertising, the, the, the Thompsons, yeah. the Ogilvies. Do you see partly, do you feel that you might be the man to disrupt conventional no, I don't think, but, uh, by the way, I don't think behaviors in, in filmmaking and TV production? No, no way, no. Uh, no, no, not that. No, we tempted we, to we didn't disrupt, just go back to that for a minute. We didn't disrupt. You see, when, when you, you mentioned that we, we acquired JWT for 525 million. Uh, the fact that we found a Japanese property that was worth 200 million helped us, but, um, which when the company thought it was worth 30 million. Um, that helped us, and that was luck. Um, Ogle, we, we, we paid 825 million. The, the, both those companies are worth many, many multiples of that now, either in market value or you know, if you were going to value it uh, on the market in some way, shape, or form. Um, we didn't really disrupt it. I think we, 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 and this is really important, I think, we appreciated more than other people the value of these things. You know, no matter what I've done or we've done to destroy value in those companies, they've survived, mm. right? We've, had, we've owned JWT since 1987 and Ogilvy from 89. And we've made mistakes. Again, another remission of uh, mm -hmm. failure. You'll, you'll give uh, us a little list of them. At the for, end yeah, of no, 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 not for public publication. Just admit, admit that you, do. you make mistakes. But whatever we like, see what, what those businesses have is what people who start businesses crave for. Right, so I started a business with somebody else, two people in one room in 1985. I remember, you know, this is a story. Morris Saatchi trying to hire Jeremy Bullmore when he was chairman of JWT to come and work for Saatchi's. Why did Morris want that? It was actually very astute, was that JWT was classy. That didn't mean that Saatchi lacked class, but Saatchi wanted more class. And Morris understood that there was, there's institutional strength, and let's call it entrepreneurial vitality. And the issue was not disruption. The issue was moving them in a slightly different way such that they would be more successful, because JWT is going to celebrate its 150th anniversary next year, I think it is. So these are phenomenally strong companies, which most people who start companies will give their eye teeth yeah. for the brand recognition. Now, why do people, why are people attracted, and they are, to working with us, with us say, in the acquisition process? Because they see us in a way, a crude way, of being a database of clients that they can tap into. And I think that's the key thing. So it wasn't quite disruption. So in relation to, you could maybe make the same analogy to the media and Hollywood side of it and the content side of it. Can we use those techniques, those established techniques and new techniques, in, a, in an evolutionary way, not revolutionary way, yeah. Yeah. To, to get greater strength? OK, I'm, I'm bound. There's a, there's a question burning from the audience. So let's call it up, 14 votes from the table, which, uh, which is the good old mobile question again. Um, every year seems to be the year of mobile. We've talked a lot about that here. Right. The theme of mobility, mobile has cropped up a lot. Um, uh, what is, what's your take on, on mobile? And where are um, your investments going to be? Every year is, I think to be fair, every year is more mobile. So I, I, my view is that the growth of smartphones means the difference. I mean, I'm not prepared to watch a football match on a mobile phone. But I, I know people who are, and they happen to be a little bit younger than me. And we'll that's come a, to your age in a minute. That that's was my all, last question. That's all. That's <laughs> all there is. You save the best till last. Mm -hmm. That's all there is, I think. At the end of the day, look, whether we like or not, this audience—I don't know what the average age of this audience is—but it's certainly on the younger side. The fact is that most media owners, most clients, most agencies are run by more mature people. Mature, but not senile. Let's put it like that. <laughs> and, and as such, it's very difficult to get your mind around change. Now, so why is it, so here's, here's a quick, so why is it that uh, we know consumers spend 10% of their time on newspapers and magazines, and we know we invest, together with our clients, 20% of our media budgets? We know that consumers spend a third of their time on mobile, but mobile is, is a growing portion of it, and internet, and yet we only spend 20%. Yeah. Uh, it takes time to change. Isn't that because you're locked into long-term media vendor agreements? No. So you're getting lots no, no, of rebates? No, no, no. no, no, no. no that's not, that doesn't wash. Zaxis goes okay. against that. No, that doesn't wash. You, you know, our, our interest, really, at the end of the day, is the whole cake. This is the point. 
you know, media owners tend to be in, interested in their slice of the cake. I'm, I'm my you asked me about 2013 or 12 or 11. I want the cake to grow. I don't care where that growth comes from as long as I have open access to it, as long as it's sort of open source, using open source in a yeah. different sense. Yeah. As long as I can get in or our people can get in, fine. I don't care where it comes from. So our legacy interest is not a legacy interest because we do TV or we do radio or we do outdoor or we do whatever. It's because we're interested in the whole thing. And you know, the demise of the advertising business and the marketing services business, you know, the, when I go back to the G word, we were gonna get killed. Mm. The R word, we were gonna get killed. We haven't, we survived. And the reason is, I think, because we do fulfill a, a purpose. Yeah. And we do fulfill, we do provide value from what we do in terms of evaluating different media. Thank you. Um, I think I've done justice to the audience. I've got just a few seconds. and. Uh, I'd like to talk, I know you hate these sort of things, but I'd like to talk a little bit I've about... I've got to go, it's time. About Sorry you. about that. It's time. I'd like to talk a little bit about you, Martin. I mean, Me? You, it's yeah, a very boring it's, subject. Yeah, no, no, no. Well, well, it's been you know, pretty boring up to now, it's going to get I'll worse. I'll listen to you. Well, okay, the, you, you know, your self-deprecation, that's an interesting, uh, interesting aspect to... to but, but, I, but what I really want to talk about is, is, is you are famous for your amazing schedule, your hectic... You cram a lot, you, you know, Ajaz Ahmed, who runs the company you acquired recently, uh, when I asked him about what question I should ask you, he said, well, how, how so can So he you... is the source, is he? No, only, only this question. Don't do him for any of the other one. <laughs> um, his question was, how can you respond to emails so quickly? How do you manage to do that? I have nothing else to do. Anyone everywhere in the world... <laughs> <laughs> I just sit there waiting for emails I from see, Charlie Crow. I see you in this big... <laughs> Big office with just like screens, you know, real Make time my day, email. Charlie. Send me an email. You must have twenty. You must have twenty p.m. No, 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 don't, no, no, no. Actually, it's very funny. Actually, if somebody sends me an email, and I'm not particularly interested in it, I do the courtesy, which is a mistake actually, of writing the word thanks. And the number of times that people, when they get the thanks, write back and say, "Is that a robot that sent oh, sent really? the thanks?" <laughs> so I wrote back. I write back thanks. <laughs> <laughs> which completely <laughs> confounds them. They, okay. they, they then believe there is a robot. Now you know the brush off from Sir Martin no, Thorne. So, so, so no, it's not a brush off. It's be, actually, I do, there is a serious point for actually responding. There is much, nothing more irritating than, than sending somebody or making a phone call and nobody returning it. And you know, even if it's just to acknowledge that somebody had the, de yeah. you know, the, the, the decency to show an interest, I think it is it's important. But uh, no, I do, I, I do do it myself. What do you do to relax? Very little. I, I, I well, I, I have a family, um, so that's one thing. You have a puppy called Savage. And it's not a puppy. <laughs> Savage is... What kind is, of a name for a dog is Savage? Well, the, 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 my wife's nickname is Sauvage. So, so when I was courting... This is really getting very personal. So, so when I was courting my wife... I went to a red set, she loves red setters. So she, I went to a red setter breeder. And I said, I want, there was a, a, there was a, a set of, what, nine, of, nine puppies. So I said, I want the best, the, 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 the most complacent, you know. <laughs> so, so his reason he's called Savage is one, because that's my wife's nickname, Sauvage. And number two, because he isn't. He isn't. Okay, that's, that's right. fine. Okay, final quick question. I heard last night, I learned that Vincent Bellore has, um, has, has an app on his phone which counts down the days to his retirement. He's got nine years, but he's even... Uh, <laughs> he he's, is in Singapore today, you know that, don't yeah. you? He's, he is. You know um, that. He's, I do. Uh, we tried. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it it would have been fun. It would have been fun to have had him here too. Maybe next year. Maybe next year, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so um, he has the countdown app, and you know we know Levy has, has already laid the foundations for it. How, how long are you going to? You going to? As long as they'll have me, Charlie. I enjoy what I'm doing. It's more, it's more fun now than it's ever been. I mean, more fun and more interesting. Um, it has its stressful moments, but I don't believe there is such a thing as stress. It's only you're not having fun. <laughs> and um, so no, I'll carry on as long. I own just under two percent of the company, so I'm not in the privileged position, if that's the right way of putting it, of owning 40% of the voting capital of the yep, company. Yep. Vincent is the, the so, arch exponent of the Fre French pyramiding. You know, you, mm. you, you own 51% of 51% of 51% of 51%, 51%, 51%, 51%, 51%, 51%, 51%, 51%, 51%, 51%, 51%, 51%, 51%, 51%, 51%, 51%, 51%, 51%, 51%, 51%, 51%, 51%, 
which means you end up exercising control on a tremendous um, quantum of assets and revenues and profits with a teeny weeny investment. He's promised me over the years that he will show me how to do that, <laughs> but, but to date, to date, he's not shown me the key. So the answer is I'll carry on as long as they say, Martin, you know, take me out to the potting shed and say, Martin, okay. you know, shoot me in the head or say, cheerio, you've well, done enough damage. We've done enough damage here and we've gone on for too long <laughs> as well, I'm afraid. Um, but um, thank you. And thank you for your questions, everybody. And can I thank you for coming you, to John. the Festival Media Agency? Anybody really got any other questions? msorrell at wpp.com. And if you get the answer, thanks. <laughs> thanks. You know what happened. <laughs> you know it's a good question. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Martin Sorrell. Thank you. Thanks,